Frankie's a pug. You hear that? It's kind of a gurgly thing. Pugs often have trouble breathing like that because you take a wolf's nose and you squish it in. Or a proto-dog. Wolves were evolved into proto-dogs which evolved into dogs which we manipulated into these. Frankie, don't listen. Mutants. Mutants are genetic variations of the original dog that we have adapted to our own likes and desires. We want a dog that looks cute with big eyes and snub noses, but it causes all this breathing problems. Fortunately, veterinarians can fix it. In reality, we wish we didn't have to fix so many genetic problems, but Frankie is so cute. We're going to help Frankie breathe better. Now, Frankie's nose, some pugs have squished in noses and they can't breathe, move air through those. It's called stenotic nares. So we're going to help Frankie by opening up her nose a little bit and then we're going to go down, I'll show you down Frankie's throat, her soft palate is probably resting on her windpipe and causing her to breathe like this. So we're going to see if we can fix that. I read an article recently in which the author argued that dogs are not natural, so I thought that it would be a suitable topic for a video. I'll come back to that article later. But my first step in preparing the subject was to type in the phrase dogs not natural in a popular search engine. There were a number of articles suggested, but halfway down the page was a section entitled People Also Ask. Here's the entry that caught my attention. The new and even heretical idea that groups of wolves evolved into dogs via natural selection means dogs are not simply domesticated wolves. They are truly their own species, shaped by the same process that created coyotes and other canids that have split from each other on the family tree. I was intrigued for three reasons. One is that there are no references to substantiate the possibly heretical claim that dogs evolved from wolves by a process of natural selection. The second reason was that this answer is not attributed to any person or organization, so there is no possibility of following an argument. My third reason for being intrigued is that the author suggests that the idea may even be heretical, but makes no attempt to describe what the orthodox view might be, or to contrast and compare their possibly heretical view with what passes for orthodoxy. In short, this answer seemed to conceal more than reveal, and it relied on the reader taking the author's viewpoint as a matter of faith. Those of you who have watched all of my videos will be aware that I have spoken many times about dog worshippers expecting us to take their word for things. I have spoken about their deceit and their aversion to evidence. They have a take-our-word-for-it approach to ideas that need proof. You know the kinds of claims they make, claims such as dogs are loyal and faithful, dogs provide unconditional love, when a dog attacks it is always the owner's fault, a dog is man's best friend, a dog will never let you down. For hundreds of years, pit bulls were known as the nanny dog because they are so good with young children. These claims go on and on. None of them stand up to scientific scrutiny, but they expect us to take their word for it. There are no reasons for us to take their word for it because they have been proven wrong so many times in the past. This anonymous author chooses to define natural in the sense of having been created through the evolutionary process of natural selection. There is a possibility that they may be correct in the original transformation from wolf to dog. I stress the phrase original transformation because it provides no explanation for modern dogs and their diversity. Scientific study of DNA proves that it is the case that dogs evolved from wolves. Over time, their snouts got shorter and their jaws got wider, 
and they evolved into dogs. Archaeological evidence also seems to back this up. Archaeological studies also show that these transformations took place in the proximity of human settlements. So the dilemma is, did the wolves bring about the transformations? Or did humans? Or, another possibility, was it a combination of the two? Wolves that were naturally human-tolerant could have mated with other human-tolerant wolves and transmitted this characteristic onto their offspring. Over time, other adaptive modifications could have developed to aid survival close to humans. There's a genetic experiment involving wild foxes that has been going on in Novosibirsk, Russia, since the late 1950s. Animals were selected that had mild, less aggressive responses to the presence of humans. These animals were mated with other foxes of a similar temperament. There were no attempts to tame the animals. Within four generations, fox cubs were starting to behave more like dogs than foxes. Many of them wagged their tails and got excited in the proximity of humans. They whined, whimpered, and licked researchers in ways that were more similar to dog pups than fox cubs. This may be the way that dogs became domesticated, although it took place over a much longer period of time, long enough for physical characteristics to change considerably between wolf and dog. This experiment also indicates how humans may have started to become more confident in the presence of wolves. That is, they were more confident with wolves that were not temperamentally inclined to attack them. Sounds reasonable. Evolution relies on chance mutations either being continued because they have an adaptive benefit or becoming extinct because they either have no adaptive benefit or are harmful to the individual and the species. Being able to run fast or have endurance in a hunt would give a wolf and the wolf species an adaptive edge that would be transmitted and endure through natural selection. Thousands of years ago, there were chance mutations that occurred to transform wolves into dogs, but was it the wolves that were doing the selection, or was it the humans? The skulls of ancient dogs and wolves are different. The dog snout is shorter, and the jaw is wider than the wolf. These two changes bring about the characteristic fake smile that dog worshippers love to tell us about. They believe that their dog is happy to see them because it is smiling. They believe that pit bull type dogs with their wide blocky heads are angelic because they appear to have a broad smile most of the time. Would the appearance of a human-like smile indicate natural selection by wolves or would it indicate human preferences? Another difference in the heads of wolves and dogs is that dogs have facial muscles that wolves don't have. Because of these muscles, dogs are able to raise their eyebrows, making their eyes look rounder and more like a human child's eyes. Dog worshippers also interpret the raising of the eyebrows as an indication of sadness or remorse. They will often talk or write about dogs showing guilt after destroying property or attacking humans. They will often talk or write about their dog displaying empathy because the dog looks sad when the owner is going through a difficult time in their lives. A common theme is that their dog helped them through a bad patch because it seemed to understand exactly what they were going through. The motto, I rescued him, then he rescued me, illustrates this faulty belief. All because the dog can raise its eyebrows. Would this chance mutation be selected by other wolves or would it be something that attracted humans? It could be argued that wolves that developed the shorter snout, the wider jaw, and the elevating eyebrows would be more successful in getting food and therefore would be in a better position to transmit their genetic material. While it could be argued, it is not convincing. Human selection is more likely. If so, there has to be unnatural selection from the very start. I have to ask myself, 
What advantages would there be to any species to transform itself from hunter-scavenger into parasite? There is one very important area in which modern dogs are different to any other canid, such as wolves, coyotes, foxes, and jackals. That area is diversity of shape. Diversity does occur in all canids. Foxes, for example, come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and coat colors. The same is true for other canids, but this diversity usually has a specific geographical and environmental distribution and provides a survival advantage to the species. The thick white coat of the Arctic fox, for example, provides a number of advantages relative to its environment and to the available prey. Its smaller size is appropriate to the type of prey available. However, it is now being overtaken by the much larger red fox because human intrusion and littering brings opportunities for the red fox rather than the arctic fox to thrive. The level of diversity in modern dogs is much greater than in any other canid. According to the Guinness Book of Records, The tallest dog is 44 inches, or 1.18 meters, measured at the shoulders, while the smallest is 3.6 inches, or 9.65 centimeters, measured at the shoulders. The largest of the species is 12 times the size of the smallest. This extreme diversity is unique to dogs. This is also true for a number of other characteristics, such as snout size, coat length and color, leg length, ear shape, and so on. These variations are unrelated to environment, food source, or geography. Did you guys just come from a long walk or something? Oh, okay, I'm just here. For him, it's a long walk. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Since dogs do not occupy an ecological niche, natural selection does not apply. Humanity, the species that dogs parasitized, now determines the shapes of dogs. Prior to the mid-19th century, there were different shapes of dogs, usually related to their purpose. The first dog show took place in 1859, and dog shows became increasingly popular after that. The purpose of dog shows was to exhibit particular types of dogs as being indicative of their kind. The idea that humans should determine what dogs looked like, rather than the operation of natural selection, was well accepted by this time, and fitted well with similar ideas about animal husbandry and plant development. These dog shows led to the development of the Kennel Club in 1873. The Kennel Club set out rules and operated a stud book for what were known as pedigree dogs. By such means, the use of dogs went from fulfilling a purpose to feeding a need for novelty. Dogs are now mainly bred for novelty, entertainment, profit, or status, rather than for any particular use. In 2008, the BBC transmitted a program called Pedigree Dogs Exposed, which was highly critical of the Kennel Club, its practices and standards. The makers of the program alleged that the Kennel Club compromised the health of purebred dogs through many of its standards and practices. Among other examples, they claimed that the gene pool of all the pugs in the UK came from around 50 individuals. I have given many examples of the scandal that is pedigree dog breeding. Here is a quote from the Bateson Report, a peer-reviewed report into dog breeding carried out in 2010. To the outsider, it seems incomprehensible that anyone should admire, let alone acquire, an animal that has difficulty in breathing or walking. Yet, people are passionate about owning and breeding animals, which they know and love, 
even though the animals manifestly exhibit serious health and welfare problems. Notwithstanding the motivations of the breeders, the time has surely come for society as a whole to take a firm grip on the welfare issues that evidently arise in dog breeding. It is difficult to define exactly what is natural, because the word has different meanings and is widely used to deceive, as in foodstuffs labeled as natural when they contain natural ingredients that have been processed in some way. It can mean something that is not made or caused by humans. Dog shapes are manipulated by humans in ways that would never occur in nature from a process of natural selection. Animals such as chihuahua dogs that could only give birth by cesarean section cannot possibly survive without humans. Flat-faced dogs suffer from brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome, or BOAS, and many require expensive surgery to allow them to breathe. The flat-faced look would never have come about by a process of evolutionary natural selection. Are dogs natural or not? It depends what you mean by natural. They certainly haven't come about their present condition by the process of natural selection, interacting with their environment. They are biological creatures, and while they were never created by humans, they have been manipulated in many different ways by humans. I will leave the final words with the article I referenced at the beginning of the video, an article by William Sailton entitled Frank and Fido, Our Creepiest Genetic Invention, The Dog. He said of the origin of the dog that, quote, we fed them, bred them, and spread them from continent to continent. While other wolf descendants died out, dogs grew into a new species. We invented the dog. In the course of engineering dogs to look, feel, and act as we wanted, we ruined millions of them. We gave them legs so short they couldn't run, noses so flat they couldn't breathe, tempers so hostile they couldn't function in society. Even our best intentions backfired. End quote. It is time to stop manipulating dogs in this way for our pleasure. The future is dog free. So now, this is the, I have it where I can grab it. Now, if I had to pull it out, I can pull it out and control it like that. That's the pellet. And now I'm going to cut off the part piece that we don't want. i put Frankie down like that. And then we're going to, we're going to open up one of these nares. This one's really, really kind of uh, stenotic or a little bit a little bit too close. So let's see if this one will come up. This one comes up a little bit. I want to give Frankie all the all the help that Frankie can get. So I'm going to cut off this much. You can already see that opens it up. And then I'm going to cut off this much over here. Got to make it match. We don't want to say that Dr. Martinez caused Frankie to be lopsided. 